Please be seated. The sitting is open. The court meets this morning to hear Turkey, Zambia, the League of Arab States, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and the African Union on the question submitted to it by the United Nations General Assembly on the legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. As I've already mentioned, each delegation is kindly asked to respect the 30-minute time allocation for its presentation this morning. The court will take a short break after the presentation of the League of Arab States. To the representative of Turkey, His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Yildiz, you have the floor, Excellency. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, good morning to all. We are here today to deliver our oral submission on an issue, the solution of which is long overdue. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict could have been settled by now if the international law, especially humanitarian law and human rights law, had been upheld and the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people had been recognized. The rules-based international system has come to a point of collapse because of injustices that are being inflicted on the Palestinian people for decades. Now, the International Court of Justice has also a case before it against Israel concerning violations of its obligations under 1948 Convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. This is a clear indication of the current consequences of violations of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people and intolerable oppression in the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. Turkey calls for the full implementation of the provisional measures indicated by the court. And we hope the Security Council will uphold its responsibility to enforce it, at least in these critical conditions, in respect of the court. The court's advisory opinion on the current file will remind the international community once again of the legal consequences arising from the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories including East Jerusalem and the gravity of the situation in whole Palestine. Palestinians seek recognition of their inalienable rights in their own land. They only want justice, equality, dignity, and their long-deserved independence. The Republic of Turkey has strong and profound bonds with the region not only with the Arabs, but also with the Jews. Jews who were oppressed centuries ago in Europe found shelter in Turkey where they were welcomed. The same happened during the Second World War. We have never hesitated to stand with the oppressed regardless of their identity. As such, Turkey cannot remain indifferent to Israeli attempts to alter the character and status of the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem. And we cannot remain indifferent to the ongoing attacks by Israel against the Palestinian people. In our written statement, we had shared our views on certain aspects of the question at hand. The points made in the written statement are as relevant following 7 October 2023 as before, if not more. Besides, 
The unfolding situation after October 7 proves once again that without addressing the root cause of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there can be no peace in the region. Israeli-Palestinian conflict did not start on 7 October 2023. The conflict is not about a certain Palestinian faction or group. The conflict dates back to an earlier century. But the real obstacle to peace is obvious. The deepening occupation by Israel of the Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem, and failure to implement the two-state vision Israel and Palestine living side by side. Palestinian people live in extremely difficult conditions under Israel's suffocating occupation. Israel's decades-long occupation has not only led to deprivation of Palestinian people of their fundamental rights, but also made them dependent on Israel's mercy. Their properties are demolished, their land is usurped, their livelihoods are confiscated. Although they are living in the 21st century, the practices they have been subject to are from Middle Ages and sometimes even worse. Today, the Palestinian people only need emancipation and dignity. Israel's ongoing occupation and Israel's ongoing and deliberately prolonged occupation and intransigent policies failing all initiatives have also left the Palestinians who were expelled from homeland to neighboring countries in limbo, in despair and hopelessness generation after generation. We believe that all unilateral acts and measures by Israel aimed at changing the character and status of the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem, constitute breach of international law and must be unconditionally rescinded. Mr. President, distinguished members, Turkey submitted a written statement pursuant to the court's order of 6 of February 2023 in accordance with Article 66, Paragraph 2 of the Statute of the Court. The scope of the questions put by the court is undoubtedly wider, but the written statement by Turkey has focused on the historical status quo in the holy places within the broader context of the status of Jerusalem. The Republic of Turkey wishes to reaffirm that this statement does not affect its legal position on any other issues not related to the current request of the General Assembly for an advisory opinion of the Court. Please allow me to touch upon a few select points to re-emphasize where we stand. Lack of political will or interest among the international community to address the root causes of the conflict created a strong sense of injustice among the Palestinians and in general in the international community. Regrettably, the United Nations Security Council, which has a primary responsibility for maintenance of international peace and security, has clearly failed to discharge its duties. The overwhelming majority of the member states of the UN have asked for an immediate and conditional ceasefire in Gaza and delivery of unhindered, sufficient and sustained humanitarian assistance. So far, regrettably, the UN Security Council has fallen short of establishing such righteous demands due to its its inherent flaws. By the same token, the situation in the occupied territories has not improved despite numerous resolutions that the UN General Assembly and Security Council resolutions adopted over decades. 
Israel's unlawful unilateral actions that are considered nil and void in many of the UN resolutions are continuously putting the two-state vision in jeopardy. Unlawful settlement activity has intensified to the extent that it is now extremely difficult to mention contiguity of the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem, which is a key to a lasting peace. Transfer of the Israeli population in the form of settlements has been changing the demographic composition of the occupied territories. Demolition of houses of the Palestinians, as well as forcible evacuations, continue under the protection of the Israeli security forces. Also, settler violence are increasing day by day against native Palestinians. One of the main aspects of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is about observing the sanctity of and the historical status quo at the holy places. Located in East Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, or Haram al-Sharif, is among the holiest sites for Muslims around the world. Therefore, its, its sanctity as a Muslim shrine must be upheld as sacrosanct at all times. The historical status quo at the holy places in Jerusalem, including in Haram al-Sharif, was established during the Ottoman era and has remained in place ever since. On 4th of April 2023, Israeli security forces stormed the Al-Aqsa mosques, beat up worshippers, and detained hundreds of them altogether during the holy month of Ramadan. This kind of brutal practice is becoming commonplace. While Muslim worshippers face the treatment above, Israeli security forces continue storming the Haram al-Sharif to provide shelter for the Jews who enter the compound in breach of the historical status quo. In addition to the holy places, the status of Jerusalem itself is also a main issue. As a result of well-known developments, the State of Israel was proclaimed on 14 May 1948. And the ensuing conflict, conflict resulted in Israel controlling more land than envisaged under the UN General Assembly Resolution 181 of 29 November 1947. An armistice line, known also as Green Line, came into the being. On 5th of June 1967, Israel launched a military offensive and occupied the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem illegally. In the following period, several UN Security Council and General Assembly resolutions affirmed that acquisition of territory by military conquest is inadmissible under the international law and confirmed that all legislative and administrative measures and actions taken by Israel, which purport to alter the status of Jerusalem, including expropriation of lands and properties thereon, are invalid and cannot change the status. Furthermore, the UN Security Council condemned in the strongest terms all measures taken to change the status of the city of Jerusalem. United Nations General Assembly, in its resolution of 4th of July 1967, also considered measures taken by Israel to change the status of the city of Jerusalem totally invalid. It called upon Israel to rescind all measures already taken and to desist forthwith from taking any action which would alter the status of Jerusalem. UN General Assembly Resolution of 14 July 1967 also reiterated this call. 
On 30th of July 1980, Israeli Parliament adopted basic law titled Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, proclaiming the complete and united Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel, which asserted a clear change into the character and status of the city of Jerusalem. In response to this illegal act, the UN Security Council resolution, I repeat, UN Security Council, not General Assembly, the UN Security Council resolution 478 in 1980 affirmed that, I quote, the enactment of the basic law by Israel constitutes a violation of international law and determines that all legislative and administrative measures and actions taken by Israel as the occupying power, which have altered or purport to alter the character and status of the holy city of Jerusalem, and in particular, the recent basic law on Jerusalem, are nil and void and must be rescinded forthwith. UN Security Council also censured, condemned in the strongest terms the enactment by Israel of the basic law on Jerusalem and the refusal to comply with relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Furthermore, the Council decided not to recognize the basic law and such other actions by Israel that, as a result of this law, seek to alter character and status of Jerusalem. In the same way, General Assembly, in several resolutions regarding the adoption of basic law, expressed its strong rejection of any changes to the status of Jerusalem. Also, the resolution adopted by the General Assembly on 30th November 2022 called upon all states, consistent with their obligations under the UN Charter and relevant Security Council resolutions following. A. Not to recognize any changes to the pre-1967 borders, including with regard to Jerusalem other than those agreed by the parties through negotiations, including by ensuring that agreements with Israel do not imply recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the territories occupied by Israel in 1967. B. To distinguish in their relevant dealings between the territory of the State of Israel and the territories occupied since 1967. Although some states deviated from these commitments, the resolutions are there are still valid and must be upheld. The UN Security Council and UN General Assembly resolutions cited above illuminate how the UN bodies and international community see the Israeli unilateral actions in the occupied Palestinian territories. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, basically, Israel is the occupying power in the occupied Palestinian territories and under the obligation to abide by international law. Therefore, any Israeli acts and or measures executed in the occupied Palestinian territories in breach of international law should be considered nil and void. The practices as well as acts and measures violating human rights must be held to account. The same especially goes for the policies and practices of Israel in Jerusalem and the holy places. Any Israeli act and measure aimed at altering the character and status of the city of Jerusalem and of the holy places, including Haram al-Sharif, should be considered nil and void and must be ended to recent immediately. I focus on these points because Turkey is deeply concerned by the unilateral policies and practices of Israel, which violate the historical status quo in Haram al-Sharif and attempt to set up 
or set a precedent to, to divide it temporarily and specially. Turkey also rejects unlawful, illegit, illegitimate and provocative measures that de facto restrict free access of Muslims into Haram al-Sharif. This is not only a breach of the historical status quo, status of Haram al-Sharif, but is also a violation of basic human rights of Muslims in the occupied territories. Following provocations by certain members of the Israeli government at the meeting of the Security Council held on 20 February 2023, the President of the Security Council reiterated the call for inter alia preserving the status quo at the holy sites in Jerusalem. I quote, the Security Council calls for upholding the unchanged, unchanged historic status quo at the holy sites in Jerusalem, in word and in practice, and emphasizes in this regard the special role of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, unquote. But in total, this regard of the international calls for upholding the historical status quo at the holy sites in Jerusalem, certain Israeli ministers continue violating the sanctity of and the historical status quo at the holy sites. In 2023, just before October 7, thousands of Israeli extremists and settlers stormed into Al-Aqsa Mosque complex during the Jewish holiday of Sukkot, mainly in response to the heinous calls by the Israeli politicians. Several resolutions of the United Nations Human Rights Council also expressed grave concern at the restrictions imposed by Israel that impede the access of Christian and Muslim worshippers to holy sites in the occupied territories. Human Rights Council resolutions demanded Israel, as the occupying power, seize all illegal actions in the occupied Palestinian territories. These include excavations in and around religious and historic sites, and all other unilateral measures aimed at altering the character, status, and demographic composition of the territory as a whole, all of which have inter alia a grave and detrimental impact, impact on the human rights of the Palestinian people and the prospects for a just and peaceful settlement. Access to and protection of places of worship and holy sites, as, as well as excavations beneath and around Al-Aqsa Mosque, have also long been subject of concern and recommendations of several human rights treaty bodies. The protection of the status of Jerusalem and the holy sites is important not only for the maintenance of the peaceful coexistence tradition among communities there, from different faiths since the Ottoman era, but also for observing the sensitivities of billions of people around the world. Mr. President, distinguished members, the scope of the Israel-Palestinian conflict and the status of Jerusalem is surely wider, ranging from settlements to transfer of Israeli settlers to the occupied territories, confiscations of land, demolition of, home, of homes, and displacement of, displacement of Palestinian civilians in violation of the international law. Today, the unfolding situation in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank is extraordinary, extremely dangerous, and if left unchecked, runs the risk of threatening not only regional but also global peace and security. I would like to emphasize once again that Turkey strongly and clearly rejects and condemns all attacks against civilians. Civilians must be protected at all times and under any circumstances. Since October 7, more than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed so far in Israel's indiscriminate, indiscriminate attacks on Gaza. Most of them are women and children. 
2.3 million civilians have been placed under full blockade by Israel, depriving them of their basic needs to survive, such as water, food, medicine, fuel, and electricity. Hospitals, refugee camps, schools, places of worship, churches, and mosques have been targeted unsparingly. Around 2 million Palestinians have been forcibly displayed. Israel's attacks have turned into collective punishment. In the West Bank, 400 Palestinians have been killed by either Israeli settlers or security forces in the past four months. As a matter of fact, 2023 has been the most violent year in illegal settler terrorism against and violence against the native Palestinians in the West Bank. Representatives of relevant UN agencies, as well as UN Human Rights Council special reporters and mandate holders have published various reports so far on violations of inalienable rights of the Palestinian people by Israel. The current trajectory risks a broader regional conflagration as well as intercommunal polarization. Furthermore, rising threats of Islamophobia, anti-Semitism and extremism all around the world must also be taken into consideration. As the injustices and the double standards that the Palestinians have been subjected to for decades continue, the reaction from the peoples of the region and beyond will only multiply. In other words, we must hold accountable before the law those responsible for their attacks on civilians. Otherwise, such outrageous behavior might be emulated elsewhere in the future. Therefore, reinstating the rule-based international system is a must. In view of the foregoing, foregoing argument, arguments and recalling the relevant resolutions of the UN General Assembly and Security Council, the Republic of Turkey respectfully calls upon the International Court of Justice to declare the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem, in illegal under the international law. Israel must also respect the historical status quo in the holy places in Jerusalem. Again, it is ever more important as we approach the holy month of Ramadan this year, while the Israeli attacks in Gaza and the West Bank continue. It is alarming to see reports regarding plans by the Israeli government to limit the prayers of the Muslims on Haram al-Sharif during Ramadan. The provocative rhetoric by certain Israeli ministers is also worrisome. Therefore, those who have conscience and morality must step in without delay. The Republic of Turkey will continue its efforts to contribute to the permanent peace between Israel and Palestine, more, urgent, more urgently for a lasting ceasefire in Gaza and immediate unhindered flow of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Drawing lessons from past experiences, Turkey has also been developing the idea of a guarantee mechanism so that future negotiations could be held in a sound environment and once achieved, a, a final settlement would hold for decades to come. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been at the top of the agenda of the both UN General Assembly and the Security Council almost since the foundation of the UN. The UN, with, with its organs, following its primary, primary responsibility of international peace and security, has adopted dozens of resolutions in relation to this conflict. It is crucial that the court issues an advisory opinion in response to the questions in the resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly. The Republic of Turkey reiterates its firm support to a negotiated two-state solution based on the UN resolutions, thus the establishment of an independent, sovereign and contiguous state of Palestine on the pre-5th June 1967 lines 
with East Jerusalem as its capital. Mr. President, distinguished members, not to repeat the previous speakers, we focused on specific subjects here. But after listening to the previous speakers in previous days, we are of the opinion that there is solid, uh, solid and efficient legal framework to declare the Israeli practices illegal and to contribute to this peace. Thank you very much. I thank the delegation of Turkey for its presentation. I invite the next participating delegation, Zambia, to address the court. And I call upon Mr. Marshal Mubambe Mushende to take the floor. Mr. President, Justice Nawaf Salam, distinguished members of the court, as you have mentioned correctly, Your Lordship, my name is Marshal Mubambe Mujende, State Council, and I'm the Solicitor General for the Republic of Zambia. I have come with my team, which includes His Excellency Mr. Sylvester Mundanda, who is the Ambassador of Zambia to the Benelux countries, which includes Belgium, Netherlands, and the Luxembourg. I also have with me the team that is on record with you. Allow me to proceed. <clears throat> Your Lordship, I have the honor and privilege to make a submission on behalf of the Republic of Zambia on the request for an advisory opinion of this court concerning the legal consequences arising from the ongoing violation by Israel of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination from its prolonged occupation, settlement, and annexation of the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character, and status of the holy city of Jerusalem, and from its alleged adoption of related discriminatory legislation and measures. My delegation appears before this court as Zambia's unwavering commitment to peace and the principles of international law, which underpin the international system. We recognize the humanity and dignity of all individuals affected by the conflict, irrespective of their nationality or ethnicity. Mr. President, the Republic of Zambia did submit its written statement to the court in July of 2023, and we shall rely on the same. With leave of court, however, allow me to augment with oral submissions which are in support of the written submissions alluded to. Mr. President, we have carefully looked at the question that has been posed to the court, and we submit at the very outset that the Republic of Zambia recognizes the court's jurisdiction to render advisory opinions in accordance with Article 65 of the United Nations Statute. As it did in the advisory opinion, on the legal consequences of the construction of a war in the occupied Palestinian territory in 2004. We, however, make the case that the question posed to the court this time around is more complex and requires Solomonic wisdom to obviate rendering an opinion that may exacerbate 
rather than resolve the complex and nuanced situation which both Palestine and Israel find themselves. The Republic of Zambia has been consistent and continues to advocate for relentless efforts aimed at achieving peace in the Middle East based on the principles of the two-state solution. And we shall revert to this issue later. Mr. President, Zambia will rely on the following legal framework in making its arguments. That is to say, number one, the United Nations Charter. Number two, the Statute of the International Court of Justice. Number three, let me just say the Oslo One Accord, instead of regurgitating the full citation. Number four, the Oslo Two Accord. And number five, we rely on the advisory opinion which this court rendered with regards to the consequences of the construction of the war in the occupied Palestinian territory in 2004. Number six, we also rely on the United Nations Security Council resolutions 242 of 1967 and 338 of 1973. Mr. President, we recognize the inalienable right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. We also recognize the legitimate security needs of the Israeli people. Both Israel and Palestine have a duty to respect international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Therefore, any recourse to the conflict should not be one that puts the blame squarely on one party, but rather one that advances a negotiated solution that culminates in a two-state solution. May it be on record, my Lord, that our support for the Palestinian people's right to self-determination remains steadfast, echoing our consistent position within the United Nations. However, it is imperative to approach this issue with a comprehensive and balanced perspective. Zambia believes that any declaration addressing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict must acknowledge the complexities and nuances inherent in the circumstances and the need to take serious consideration of the difficult situation that both parties find themselves as they strive to defend the respective rights of their people. Mr. President, sir, the Republic of Zambia is cognizant of the fact that at the center of the conflict is the territorial dispute and rejection of the partition plan since the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. The United Nations has historically attempted to resolve this conflict through political processes which culminated in various peace treaties and Security Council resolutions, such as the Oslo Accords and the Security Council resolutions 242 of 1967 and 338 of 1973. There is also the historic exchange of letters between the late former Prime Minister of Israel, may he so rest in peace, Isaac Rabin, and the late former Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman, may he so rest in peace, the late Yasser Arafat, dated 9 September 1993. This exchange, Your Lordship, and members of the court, 
which carries no time limit, no time limit on its validity, contains mutual declarations of recognition, reciprocal commitments to negotiate peace. To this end, the parties, and I mean both Israel and Palestine, are expected to refrain from undermining or prejudicing the accords through unilateral or third party initiatives or actions and from any other initiatives and attempts to impose a solution that seeks to circumvent the agreed upon negotiations. Mr. President, members of the court, there is an argument that negotiations have proved to be ineffective in the past and therefore the resort to advisory opinions. The Republic of Zambia respectfully submits that the Israelis, the Palestinians, regional states and the broader international community and indeed the United Nations Security Council should consider the reasons why the negotiations failed in the first place and address that issue before resorting to a solution that seeks to bypass the agreed upon negotiations. In the case of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, if it is established that negotiations have been ineffective, it may call then for an addendum to the Oslo One Accord to amend Article 15, which provides for negotiations and replace that clause with another mode of dispute settlement. Mr. President, in any event, one may also argue that the advisory opinion by this court on the legal consequences of the construction of the war in the occupied Palestinian territory in 2004 was also ineffective. Should it then be argued also that the international community must abandon advisory opinions of this court? We submit that postmortems are important in evaluating the challenges and limitations of the dispute settlement mechanisms that are applied to resolve the problem before resorting to another mode. Mr. President and members of the court, it is our firm submission that the Oslo Accords remain the only valid, agreed legal source of authority for the division of control, powers, and responsibilities between Palestine and Israel over the various parts of the territories. Article 15 of the Oslo One Accord prescribes negotiations as the mode of resolving disputes. No other legal or normative framework, whether through international conventions, declarations, or UN resolutions, has substituted the agreed upon, still valid legal framework of the Oslo Accords unless and until the same are amended. Zambia proposes that the final determination of this matter would be for the parties to resolve their dispute through a settlement means of their choice, which is negotiations. The just and sustainable two-state solution cannot be imposed from the outside through an advisory opinion. The Republic of Zambia fully supports this recognized and established framework for the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The court needs to safeguard 
the established legal framework as endorsed by the parties bilateral agreements and reflected in repeated United Nations resolutions, both with respect to the administration of the territory pending a negotiated outcome and with respect to reaching a permanent status solution or resolution that addresses legitimate needs and aspirations of both sides. The parties have an obligation under Article 31, Clause 7 of the 1995 Palestinian Interim Agreement on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which is Oslo II Accord, not to initiate or take any step that will change the status of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip pending the outcome of the permanent status negotiations. Mr. President, members of the court, this court did announce or pronounce itself on the importance of continued negotiations in its advisory opinion of 2004 on the legal consequences of the construction of the war in the occupied Palestinian territory. The court encouraged efforts to achieve a negotiated solution to the conflict and the establishment of a Palestinian state existing side by side with Israel for peace and security for all in the region. This court while noting that illegal actions and unilateral decisions were taken on both sides, confirmed the continued validity of the legal framework by stipulating that this situation can be ended only through implementation of the agreements in good faith. Mr. President, Members of the court, as we conclude, we wish to submit that the court is neither the only dispute resolution mechanism available, nor is it the best in all circumstances. Let me repeat that one. As we conclude, we wish to submit that the court is neither the only dispute resolution mechanism available nor is it the best in all circumstances. The best dispute re resolution mechanism is one that delivers optimal and sustainable solutions depending on the peculiar circumstances of each case. And there is certainly no one size fit all. Where, for instance, the objective of the dispute resolution mechanism is to blame one party or the other or to solely determine a winner or a loser, then we have no doubt that the court is the best forum. Mr. President, those of us that have practiced law for many years know how in determining a winner, in determining a winner and a loser, the court decisions have, in almost all cases, left permanently ruined relationships between neighbors on a difference which could have been resolved in a better way by adopting alternative dispute mechanisms such as a negotiated settlement, conciliation, or mediation. In conclusion, therefore, the Republic of Zambia reiterates the call for relentless efforts aimed at achieving peace in the Middle East based on the principles of a two-state solution. Both Israel and Palestine have a duty 
to respect international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Therefore, any recourse to the conflict should not be one that puts a blame squarely on one party, but rather one that advances a negotiated solution, which culminates in a two-state solution. The Republic of Zambia surmises that the court should not exercise its jurisdiction under Article 65 of the statute but rather give deference and sanctity to the bilateral agreements existing between the two states and indeed give deference to the doctrine of party autonomy and pacta sunt servanda. We argue in the alternative, we conclude in the alternative that the court, should the court decide to exercise its jurisdiction to render the sought advisory opinion, which as we said, it has the jurisdiction, then the opinion should encourage and assist the parties to respect the legal commitments including conducting credible negotiations and not make it more difficult for them to do so. This is also anchored on the fundamental international legal principle of Pacta Sunt Sevanda. In this way, Your Lordship, the court would essentially be upholding the sovereign rights of the two parties. Mr. President, I thank you for your attention. I thank the delegation of Zambia for its presentation. I invite the next participating delegation, the League of Arab States, to address the court, and I call Mr. Abdel Hakim Al Rifai to the podium. Thank you, Mr. President, honorable members of the court. It's a great honor and privilege to appear before you today on behalf of the League of Arab States. I would like to read a statement by His Excellency, Mr. Ahmed Abul Ghait, Secretary General of the League of Arab States. The League of Arab States attaches high importance to the present proceedings, hoping that they contribute to safeguarding the principles of international law, to uphold the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people to self-determination, and end the last oppressive, expansionist, apartheid, settler, colonial occupation still standing in the 21st century. The persistence of this occupation, acts of genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crimes, crimes against humanity, displacement of populations, imprisonment of Palestinians behind illegal segregation walls, expansion of illegal settlements, creating new political realities on the ground, aiming at compli complicating the dismantling of the occupation. All will never discourage Palestinians from claiming their legitimate inalienable rights. The insistence on placing Israel above the law through the politicization of accountability and adopting double standards in the application of justice is a direct threat to international peace and stability. Ending Israel's total impunity and subjecting it, like any other state, to the universal rules of international law will help annul its pretexts to systematically reject peace initiatives, the most serious of which is the Arab Peace Initiative of 2002, which offered full normalization of relations with all Arab states in exchange of Israel only respecting its already established obligations under the bodies of international law, human rights laws, and the United Nations Security Council and 
General Assembly resolutions. This prolonged occupation is an affront to international justice. The failure to bring it to an end has led to the current horrors perpetrated against the Palestinian people, amounting to genocide. There can be no moral or juridical justification for occupying lands, killing, terrorizing, and displacing their populations. The League of Arab States trusts the esteemed court will confirm the illegality of this occupation and unambiguously rule on the legal consequences for all parties, especially those who turn a blind eye, facilitate, assist, or participate in any way in perpetuating this illegal situation. Only the rule of law, not the prevailing law of the jungle, will pave the way to peace in the whole region. Ending the occupation is the gateway to peaceful coexistence. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I now respectfully request, Mr. President, that you call on Dr. Ralph Wild, Senior Counsel and Advocate, to address the legal questions before the Court. Thank you. I thank Mr. Rifai. I now give the floor to Mr. Ralph Wild. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, distinguished members of the Court, it's a great honor and privilege to appear before you and to represent the League of Arab States. The Palestinian people have been denied the exercise of their legal right to self-determination through the more than century-long violent, colonial, racist effort to establish a nation-state exclusively for the Jewish people in the land of mandatory Palestine. When this began after the First World War, the Jewish population of that land was 11%. Forcibly implementing Zionism in this demographic context has necessarily involved the extermination or forced displacement of some of the non-Jewish Palestinian population, the exercise of domination over and subjugation, dispossession and immiseration of remaining non-Jewish Palestinians, the emigration to that land of Jewish people, regardless of any direct personal link, and the denial of Palestinian refugees the right to return, all operating through a racist distinction privileging Jewish people over non-Jewish Palestinian people. This has necessitated serious violations of all the fundamental Jos Kogan's and Erga Omne's norms of international law. The right of self-determination, the prohibitions on aggression, genocide, crimes against humanity, racial discrimination, apartheid and torture, and the core protections of IHL. Today, I will address first violations of international law arising out of the regime of racial domination, apartheid, perpetrated against the Palestinian people across the entire land of historic Palestine. And then, second, the existential illegality of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian Gaza Strip and West Bank, including East Jerusalem, since 1967. As a necessary prerequisite, I must begin with the special right granted to the Palestinian people in the League Covenant. The legal right of self-determination of the Palestinian people originates in the sacred trust obligations of Article 22 of the League Covenant, part of the Versailles Treaty. Palestine, an A-class mandate under British colonial rule, was after the First World War, supposed to have its existence as an independent state provisionally recognized, a sui generis right of self-determination. The UK and other members of the League Council attempted to bypass this, incorporating the 1917 Balfour Declaration commitment to establishing a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine into the instrument stipulating how the mandate would operate.
However, the council had no legal power to bypass the covenant in this way. It acted ultra virus, and the relevant provisions were legally void. There was and is no legal basis in that mandate instrument for either a specifically Jewish state in Palestine or the UK's failure to discharge the sacred trust obligation to implement Palestinian self-determination. After the Second World War, a self-determination right applicable to colonial peoples generally crystallized in international law. For the Palestinian people, this essentially corresponded to and supplemented the pre-existing covenant right regarding the same single territory. The 1947 proposal to partition Palestine was contrary to this, the Arab rejection and affirmation of the legal status quo. In 1948 then, Palestine was legally a single territory with a single population enjoying a right of self-determination on a unitary basis. Despite this, a state of Israel specifically for Jewish people was proclaimed in 1948 by those controlling 78%, more than three quarters of Palestine, accompanied by the forced displacement of a significant number of the non-Jewish Palestinian population, the Nakba catastrophe. This illegal secession was an egregious violation of Palestinian self-determination. Israel's statehood was recognized and Israel admitted as a UN member despite this illegality. Israel is not the legal continuation or successor of the mandate. This violation of Palestinian self-determination is ongoing and unresolved. Two key elements are, first, Palestinian people not displaced from the land proclaimed to be of Israel in 48 and their descendants have been forced to live as citizens, presently they constitute 17.2%, of a state conceived to be of and for another racial group under the domination of that group necessarily treated as second class because of their race. Second, Palestinian people displaced from that land and their descendants cannot return. These are serious breaches of the right of self-determination, the prohibitions of racial discrimination and apartheid, and the right of return. They must end immediately. As if this ongoing Nakba was not catastrophic enough, in 1967, Israel captured the remaining 22% of historic Palestine, the Gaza Strip and West Bank, including East Jerusalem, the Naksa. It's maintained that use of force to remain in control for the 57 year period since. For more than half a century then, a state defined to be of and for Jewish people exclusively has governed the entire land of historic Palestine and the Palestinian people there. And the regime of racial domination, apartheid, and denying return has been extended throughout. In the case of Palestinians living in the occupied territory, this has involved the same serious violations of international law supplemented by serious violations of norms applicable in occupied territory. Indeed, these people are subject to an even more extreme form of racist domination, as they aren't even citizens of the state exercising authority over them. Even in East Jerusalem, which Israel has purported to annex, the majority non-Jewish Palestinian residents don't have citizenship, whereas Jewish residents, including illegal settlers, are citizens. Just as in territorial Israel, in occupied territory, 
these serious violations concerning how Israel exercises authority over the Palestinian people must end immediately. However, here a more fundamental matter must also be addressed. The illegality of the exercise of authority itself. The enduring Palestinian right of self-determination means that the Palestinian people and the state of Palestine, not Israel, are sovereign over the territory Israel captured in 67. For Israel, the land is extraterritorial, and, given what I said about the mandate, territory over which it has no legal sovereign entitlement. Despite this, Israel has purported to annex East Jerusalem and taken various actions there and in the rest of the West Bank, constituting de jure and de facto purported annexation, including implanting settlements. It is Israeli policy that Israel should be not only the exclusive authority over the entire land between the river and the sea, but also the exclusive sovereign authority there. This constitutes a complete repudiation of Palestinian self-determination as a legal right, since it empties the right entirely of any territorial content. Actualizing this through de facto and de jure purported annexation is, first, a serious violation of Palestinian self-determination, and second, because it's a, 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 enabled through the use of force, a violation of the prohibition on the purported acquisition of territory through the use of force in the law on the use of force, and so an aggression. Serious violations of further areas of law re regulating the conduct of the occupation are also being perpetrated, notably the prohibitions on implanting settlements and altering, unless absolutely prevented, the legal, political, social, and religious status quo. The occupation is therefore existentially illegal because of its use to actualize purported annexation. To end this serious illegality, it must be terminated. Israel must renounce all sovereignty claims and all settlements must be removed immediately. However, this is not the only basis on which the occupation's existential legality must be addressed. We need to delve deeper into both the law of self-determination and the law on the use of force. Beginning with self-determination, this right, when applied to the Palestinian people in the territory Israel captured in 67, is a right to be entirely self-governing, free from Israeli domination. Consequently, the Palestinian people have a legal right to the immediate end of the occupation and Israel has a correlative legal duty to immediately terminate the occupation. This right exists and operates simply and exclusively because the Palestinian people are entitled to it. It does not depend on others agreeing to its realization. It is a right. It's a repudiation of trusteeship whereby colonial peoples were ostensibly to be granted freedom only if and when they were deemed ready because of their stage of development determined by the racist standard of civilization. The anti-colonial self-determination rule replaced this with a right based on the automatic immediate entitlement of all people to freedom without preconditions. In the words of General Assembly 1514, inadequacy of preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. Some suggest that the Palestinian people were offered and rejected deals 
that could have ended the occupation. And, therefore, Israel can maintain it pending a settlement. Even assuming, arguendo, the veracity of this account, the deals involved a further loss of the sovereign territory of the Palestinian people. Israel cannot lawfully demand concessions on Palestinian rights as the price for ending its impediment to Palestinian freedom. This would mean Israel using force to coerce the Palestinian people to give up some of their peremptory legal rights, illegal in the law on the use of force, and necessarily voiding the relevant terms of any agreement reached. The Palestinian people are legally entitled to reject a further loss of land over which they have an exclusive legal peremptory right. Any such rejection makes no difference to Israel's immediate legal obligation to end the occupation. Turning to the law on the use of force, Israel's control over the Palestinian territory since 67 as a military occupation is an ongoing use of force. As such, its existential legality is determined by the law on the use of force as a general matter beyond the specific issue of annexation. Israel captured the Gaza Strip and West Bank from Egypt and Jordan in the war it launched against them and Syria. It claimed to be acting in self-defense, anticipating a non-immediately imminent attack. The war was over after six days. Peace treaties between Israel and Egypt and Jordan were subsequently adopted. Despite this, Israel maintained control of the territory, continuing the use of force enabling its capture. Israel's 67 war was illegal in the Yossad Bellum, even assuming, arguendo, its claim of a feared attack. States can't lawfully use force in non-immediately imminent anticipatory self-defense. Alternatively, Assuming, again arguendo, that the war was lawful, the justification ended after six days. However, the Yos Ad Bellum requirements continued to apply to the occupation as itself a continuing use of force. In 1967, with self-determination well established in international law, states could not lawfully use force to retain control over a self-determination unit captured in war unless the legal test justifying the initial use of force also justified on the same basis the use of force in retaining control. Moreover, this justification would need to continue not only in the immediate aftermath, but for more than half a century. Manifestly, this legal test has not been met. Israel's exercise of control over the Gaza Strip and West Bank through the use of force has been illegal in the Yos Ad Bellum since the capture of the territory, or at least very soon after, afterwards. The occupation is, therefore, again, existentially illegal in the law on the use of force and aggression, this time as a general matter, beyond illegality specific to annexation. To terminate this serious violation, the occupation must, likewise, end immediately. What of Israel's current military action in Gaza? This is not a war that began in October 2023. It's a drastic scaling up of the force exercised there and in the West Bank on a continual basis since 67. A justification for a new phase in an ongoing illegal use of force 
cannot be constructed solely out of the consequences of violent resistance to that illegal use of force. Otherwise, an illegal use of force would be rendered lawful because those subject to it violently resisted. Circular logic with a perverse outcome. More generally, Israel cannot lawfully use force to control the Palestinian territory for security purposes pending an agreement providing security guarantees. States can only lawfully use force outside their borders in extremely narrow circumstances. Beyond that, they must address, they must address security concerns non-forcibly. The USA, UK and Zambia suggested here that there is a sui generis applicable legal framework an Israeli-Palestinian lex specialis. This somehow supersedes the rules of international law determining whether the occupation is existentially lawful. Instead, we have a new rule justifying the occupation until there is a peace agreement meeting Israeli security needs. This is the law as these states would like it to be, not the law as it is. It has no basis in Resolution 242, Oslo, or any other resolutions or agreements. Actually, you are being invited to do away with the very operation of some of the fundamental peremptory rules of international law itself. As a result, the matters these rules conceive as rights vested in the Palestinian people would be realized only if agreement is reached and only on the basis of such agreement. At best, if there is an agreement, this means one that need not be compatible with Palestinian peremptory legal rights, determined only by the acute power imbalance in Israel's favor. At worst, if there is no agreement, this means that the indefinite continuation of Israeli rule over the Palestinian people in the OPT on the basis of racist supremacy and a claim to sovereignty would be lawful. This is an affront to the international rule of law, to the UN Charter imperative to settle disputes in conformity with international law, and to your judicial function as guardians of the international legal system. A final potential basis sometimes invoked to justify continuing the occupation should be addressed. Occupation and human rights law, applicable to illegal and lawful occupations alike, oblige Israel to address security threats in occupied territory. However, they only regulate the conduct of an occupation when it exists they don't also provide a legal basis for that existence itself. Existential legality is determined by the law of self-determination and the jos ad bellum only. There is no backdoor legal basis for Israel to maintain the occupation through the imperatives of occupation and human rights law. In sum, the occupation of the Palestinian Gaza Strip and West Bank, including East Jerusalem, is existentially illegal on two mutually reinforcing bases. First, the law on the use of force. Here the occupation is illegal, both as a use of force without valid justification and because it's enabling an illegal purported annexation. As such, it is an aggression. Second, the law of self-determination. Here, it's illegal again because of the association with illegal purported annexation, and also, more generally, because it is quite simply 
an exercise of authority over the Palestinian people that by its very nature violates their right to freedom. This multifaceted existential illegality involving serious violations of peremptory norms has two key consequences. First, the occupation must end. Israel must renounce its claim to sovereignty over the Palestinian territory. All settlers must be removed immediately. This is required to end the illegality, to discharge the positive obligation to enable immediate Palestinian self-administration, and because Israel lacks any legal entitlement to exercise authority. Second, in the absence of the occupation ending, necessarily everything Israel does in the Palestinian territory lacks a valid international legal basis and is therefore subject to the Namibia exception invalid. Not only those things violating the law regulating the conduct of the occupation. Those norms entitle and require Israel to do certain things. But this doesn't alter the more fundamental position from the law on the use of force and self-determination that Israel lacks any valid authority to do anything. And whatever it does is illegal, even if compliant with or pursuant to the conduct regulatory rules. I will close by quoting Palestinian academic and poet Rifat al from his final poem posted 36 days before he was killed by Israel in Gaza on the 6th of December, 2023. If I must die, you must live to tell my story. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a story. Thank you for your attention. I thank the delegation of the Arab League for its presentation. And before I invite the next delegation to make its oral uh, statement, the court will observe a break for 10 minutes. The sitting is suspended.
Please be seated. The sitting is resumed. I now invite the next participating delegation, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, to address the court. And I call His Excellency, Mr. Brahim Hussain Taha, to the podium. Sir, you have the floor. Mr. President, um, members of the court, it's an honor to appear before you on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation to express uh, the trust we place in your high court that through the advisory opinion sought you may enlighten further the United Nations General Assembly in its task. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation brings together 57 member states and is the collective voice of the Islamic world. This um, intergovernmental organization was founded following the arson attack in 1969 against the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Thus, the charter of our organization mentions among its goals our support for the right of the Palestinian people to create its uh, sovereign state with Al-Quds al-Sharif as its capital. <clears throat> That's to say that our organization is particularly attentive to the just struggle of this people and is profoundly preoccupied by the ongoing aggression which um, Israel, the occupying power, is waging against the Palestinian people in Gaza and the vital risks that Israel's operations are exposing it to as well. Um, our organization held an extraordinary summit in Riyadh on 11 November last devoted to this matter. I should like to inform you here of the position taken on that occasion by the organization that I represent. Faced with the gravity of the situation, we warned against the consequences of the war being waged by the Israeli occupier in the Gaza trip. We condemn this aggression which has uh, for almost five months been uh, causing thousands of victims and giving rise to massive war crimes and a risk of genocide, as you recognized in your order of 26th of January. We condemn with the same force the crimes committed by Israel, the occupying power, and the settlers in the West Bank and in the city of Al-Quds al, al sharif We denounce the refusal by Israel, the occupying power, to end its illegal occupation of Palestinian territory, as well as the multiple violations of norms of international law brought about by this uh, continuing occupation and we deplore the inability of the Security Council to uphold international law, to halt this spiral of violence and to render justice to the Palestinian people. Mr. President, members of the court, it is against this uh, backdrop that we recalled that a just, lasting and comprehensive peace based on the two-state solution is the only way of ensuring the security and stability of all peoples in the region and protect them from the cycle of violence and war. In the same spirit, we ask that all countries cease exporting arms and munitions to the occupation authorities knowing that the army and the settlers are using them against the Palestinian people. On this occasion, we uh, took pains to denounce all forms of hatred and discrimination and all assertions that enshrine the culture of hatred and extremism, and we uh, proclaim the imperative for the international community to take 
immediate and swift measures to end the massacre and the targeting of Palestinian civilians so as to confirm that there's no uh, difference between one life and another, nor discrimination on the basis of nationality, race or religion. Those are the conditions without which no lasting peace is possible. <clears throat> we also expect your court to condemn the accelerated colonization of East Jerusalem as well as the Israeli attacks conducted against Islamic and Christian holy places at al Qod. So, therefore, we hope that the advisory opinion you will render will be an opportunity to recall under your authority the imperative duty incumbent on Israel, the occupying power, to end its occupation of Palestinian territories prolonged for far too long and to repair all the consequences. And now our counsel, Madame Chemillier Gendreau, to whom I respectfully ask you to give the floor, Mr. President, uh, will set out the legal aspects on which the organization of Islamic cooperation believes it can provide some further clarification. Thank you. Uh, Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Tamha. I now invite uh, Madame Monique Chemilly Chantreau to the podium. You have the floor, Madame. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam, uh, Mr. President. It's on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation that I have the honor to appear before you to this morning. I'm going to look at three elements of the situation which lie at the heart of your opinion. Now, some of the participating states in the instant proceedings requested your court to decline your jurisdiction. They were of the opinion that the request for an opinion would upset the negotiations purportedly underway between the protagonists and that these negotiations were the only way towards peace. But let's have a look at the facts. Let's establish them in their truth. Because that's an indispensable condition for justice to prevail. Now, are there negotiations underway between Israel and Palestine? The truth of this question is that there aren't any more. This is a myth which has long been artificially maintained, but which, if you look at current events, has totally collapsed. And even the parties involved admit this. Is the court in a position to establish truth on this point? Now, some participants in the instant proceedings have argued that you should decline your jurisdiction on account of some supposed difficulty to access the facts. But the case file that you receive from the services of the UN themselves have all the elements, all the elements you need on which to base the opinion requested. Thus, it is a known fact that the Oslo Accords, dating back to 1993 and 1995, that their objectives were intended to be achieved by 1999 at the latest, and that this time frame has not been met, and that subsequent meetings held in Sharm el-Sheikh in 1999 and Cape David in 2000 bore no fruit. From then on, neither the redeployment of Israel nor the consolidation of the Palestinian authorities' autonomy has come to pass. The outlook for the Oslo Accords hinged on compliance with Resolutions 242 and 338 of the Security Council, where they are explicitly mentioned. This compliance required the withdrawal by Israel from occupied Palestinian territory in 1967. Article 18 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties provides that parties to an agreement must abstain from acts which deprive the treaty of its object and purpose. Thus, Israel's accelerated settling of Jewish colonies on Palestinian territory has deprived the Oslo Accords both of their object and of their purpose. 
Israel's politicians have confirmed the demise of negotiations when they denounced the Oslo Accords as of the year 2000. That's more than 20 years ago. At that time, Ariel Sharon declared to the Haaretz, we, I quote him, we're not going to continue Oslo, no more Oslo, Oslo, it's finished. End of quotation. More recently, on 12 December 2023, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu asserted, I'm quoting him, I shall not allow Israel to repeat the mistake of the Oslo Accords. End of quotation. Your court will recognise that we are confronted here by a particularly noteworthy breach of good faith. Israel is a member of the United Nations. It's bound by the resolutions of this organisation as well as by specific undertakings it made. Yet it rides roughshod over the entire body, the state in question, appropriates Palestinian territory, expels its people, denies Palestine the right to self-determination by all means available. You recalled in your judgment of 2018 that when states engage in negotiations, I quote you, they must conduct them in good faith. End of quotation. Well, it would appear that Israel's good faith vanished shortly after engaging in the Oslo negotiations. Thus, no negotiation on the horizon right now which needs protection. Just an ongoing war and the refusal of Israeli authorities to open any political perspective based on international law. That's why the argument whereby a finding of jurisdiction to give this opinion would in some way bar the way to a negotiated peace is an argument wholly without merit. Now, this is my second point. I'd like to dwell a little longer on the question of negotiations to make a substantive remark here. Palestinians will not recover their legitimate rights by direct bilateral negotiations with Israel, and there are two reasons why not. The first relates to the overwhelming inequality between the two parties. Palestine is under Israel's military domination, and its representatives find themselves in a position of structural weakness. As such, any negotiation will be biased, and the resultant treaty will necessarily be unbalanced. The second obstacle relates to the fact that in negotiations which have taken place up to now, Israel has attempted to make the Palestinians make concessions to the fundamental rights they have under international law. The principal violation, which is the source indeed of the other violations, lies in Israel's persistent refusal to let or to give the Palestinian people the right to self-determination. At no moment since the end of the mandate, British mandate in 1947, has Israel's leaders admitted with sincerity that a Palestinian state could coexist with them in Palestine. Israel's Prime Minister confirmed this on 20 January, through his opposition to any Palestinian sovereignty. When Israel pretended to negotiate the Palestinians' right to statehood, it was only to concede a caricature thereof, demilitarized power, enclave, dispersed over a fragmented territory with reduced access to its own natural resources, and yet the right of people to self-determination is a just Kogan's norm. It is not some constitutive right which could only arise if recognised by Israel. Not at all. It's a declarative right, inherent to the situation of the colonised people of Palestine. And it exists from the moment this people, the Palestinian people, decided to declaim it. Thus, purely and simply, this is not a negotiable right. 
Israel has occupied, as of 1967, Palestinian territories subsequent to a military action which was carried out in breach of the core rule prohibiting the use of force. So Israel is occupying a territory over which has no rights. Israel must withdraw. And that's not negotiable either. By colonising this territory, Israel breaches the prohibition of transferring population from the occupying power into the occupied territory. And Israel's official plan is to continue this unlawful act. From the 700,000 currently on the West Bank and in Jerusalem, the settlers should pass the million number as fast as possible according to Minister Smotrich, that's what he said, on 12 July 2023. So Israel has officialized this breach by including in its basic law of 2018 the development of Jewish settlements as a basic value of Israeli society. This notwithstanding that international law requires the dismantling of all these settlements and here, yet again, we have before us an obligation which is non-negotiable. The security of Palestinians is seriously threatened. They are dying in thousands under Israeli bombs in Gaza since 7 October. And in the West Bank, according to Israeli sources, 367 Palestinians have been killed since 7 October, including 94 children. 2,960 Palestinians have been arrested and Palestinian sources are of the opinion that these figures are highly underestimated. <coughs> Settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem freely wreak violence against the Palestinians. They're encouraged. They are armed by the State of Israel itself. So the dispossession of their lands and the repression to which the Palestinians are subject to has intensified over the last months. And at the same time, a policy of discrimination which constitutes apartheid. All these violations of fundamental rights must stop. Once again, it's not negotiable. To give the requested opinion, your court will have to look at the question of Jerusalem. Now, this city wasn't included in the territory destined to Israel by Resolutions 181 of the General Assembly of the UN proposing a partition, a partition plan for Palestine. When it was admitted to the UN in 1949, Israel solemnly accepted the principles of the UN Charter and the resolutions voted by its organs. Thus, there was recognition that Jerusalem had not been attributed to Israel. However, by taking over the west part of the city by force in 1948 and in 1967 the east part of the city, Israel made Jerusalem its reunited capital in 1980. Since then, East Jerusalem has undergone a forced Israelization via intense settlement this is considered as irreversible by Israeli leaders. However, East Jerusalem has no other status than that of a territory occupied militarily by foreign power. And like all, indeed, of Palestinian territory occupied since 1967. So Israel has to withdraw, has to withdraw in favour of the Palestinian people as the relevant uh, resolutions of the Security Council and the General Assembly have required constantly. The holy places have to be freely preserved and open to all those who wish to go there. And that's not negotiable either. Disregarding these legal imperatives shared by all nations, Israel would like to legalize its unlawful actions, which I've just mentioned, by placing them in an agreement, 
Yet if one subjects the situation to legal analysis, what becomes apparent is that Israel has no right over Palestine, only duties. And the preservation of inter international public order based on shared non-derogable norms depends on their being complied with. The responsibility of this compliance falls to the United Nations, which is mandated with peacekeeping. They have been, they have been confided with Palestine's decolonisation case file by the failure of the mandate given to the UK. The UN is the only authority capable of resolving on a legal basis the situation created by decades of failure. And if peace must come, from an agreement between parties, the parties, this must be concluded under the auspices of the United Nations, guarantors of legal compliance and not under the arbitrary sponsorship of a third state lacking in objectivity. Thus, the way forward, based on the findings of your opinion, should ensure that the agreement re-establishing the Palestinians in all their rights will respect the fundamental norms which currently are the target of circumvention. If that weren't to be the case, the future peace treaty would fall under the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties which provides... I quote, a treaty is void if at the time of its conclusion it conflicts with the peremptory norm of general international law. End of citation. This brings me to my last point, uh, the second question which is being put to your court by the General Assembly of the UN. You are asked about the legal status of the occupation and on the legal consequences arising from it. You must thus examine Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory holistically in the light of international law. Well, first of all, it's jus ad bellum, the law which governs the use of force by states. This includes the very important norm of the prohibition of the threat of use or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Now, it is established that it is by the use of force that Israel occupied Palestine in 1967, as the Security Council and the General Assembly have ceaselessly recalled. This use of force directed against uh, territorial integrity and Palestinians' uh, political independence which is today recognised as a state by the UN. So the occupation was unlawful from the very beginning. This illegality is manifest since 1967 by the way in which this occupation has been conducted. It breaches all the conditions set out in the law of Hague and Geneva regarding military occupation of foreign territories. These conditions are identified by the manual of the International Committee of the Red Cross. The occupying power may not modify the structure and characteristics, intrinsic characteristics of the occupied territory over which it acquires no sovereignty. Israel has ceaselessly changed these characteristics for its own benefit. Occupation is and should remain a temporary situation. Now, Israel's been occupying Palestine for 66 years now, and its leaders openly broadcast their intention to indefinitely pursue this occupation. Israel must administer excuse me, the territory in the interest of the local population, taking into account its needs, and the needs of the Palestinians have been cruelly ignored. Israel must not exercise its authority to serve its own interests and those of its own population, yet all of Israel's policies and practices are directed for the benefit of Israeli settlers and in breach of the Palestinians' rights and interests. These are the conditions 
in which Israel has developed the occupation of Palestinian territory, conditions whose complete evidence can be found in UN reports. And they will lead you to conclude that this occupation, by its duration, by the practices of it, is the pretext for an annexation plan. This, officialised regarding Jerusalem, has been implemented de facto for the West Bank. Well, as for Gaza, total war underway there, and the plans announced by the government of Israel confirm the will of Israel to maintain their mastery over this territory. The result of all this, as your court doubtless will confirm, is that the occupation by Israel of Palestinian territory is triply unlawful. It is unlawful at its source, having breached the prohibition of the use of force. It is unlawful on account of the means used, which constitute systematic violations of humanitarian law and human rights law. It is unlawful by its aim, objective aim, being to annex Palestinian territories, thus depriving the people of Palestine of its fundamental right to self-determination. I'd now like to just give you a few of my reflections to conclude. Israel's unjustified and unpunished use of violence against the Palestinians leads to yet more violence in response in an infernal cycle, that of vengeance. And vengeance naturally favours the strongest. This is the murderous chain of events tragically taking place as we watch. To break this chain, a th impartial third party is needed, authoritatively asserting what the application of a common norm should be. It falls to your court when you hand down this opinion to bring all of this conflict back under the spotlight of the law. This law allows you to declare what rules should be applied in a critical situation, but also what measures can be taken when these rules are persistently violated. Let me recall that the submissions of the Organisation of Islamic Cooperation remain unchanged with respect to our written comments, but I will allow myself, if that is all right, to refer to two of them. I recall solely that the organisation that I represent requests the court to enjoin Israel to cease the violations which have been pointed out and to require the UN and their member states to use all measures available to bring the situation to an end, including sanctions against the responsible state. In peroration, Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, I'd like to quote Israeli Rear Admiral Ami Ayalon, who ran Israel's domestic intelligence service for a number of years. Now, his personal path in life has led him to question the concept of the enemy and assess the dead end in which Israel finds itself after having chosen violent repression to accompany its refusal of a political solution. A few weeks ago, he concluded an interview given to a French newspaper by saying, I'm quoting him now, the international community should play a beneficial role. We need someone from the outside to show us our mistakes. End of quotation. So, saving the Israelis from themselves, that will be the contribution of the international community thanks to your advisory opinion. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank the delegation of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation for its presentation. I invite the next participating delegation, the African Union, to address the court and call Madam Professor Hajer Geldish to the podium. Madam, you have the floor. 
Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it's an honor for me to represent the African Union, an organization numbering 55 member states. On this last day of pleadings, within the framework of the present advisory proceedings, it's important to recall the historical context and the tragic circumstances that prompted the UN General Assembly to request once again and regrettably for the international community an advisory opinion from the court on the situation of the occupied Palestinian territories. Now the history of Palestine is a history of dispossession, displacement and of dehumanization. It's the history of an injustice. It's the tragedy of a people who for over seven decades is systematically subjugated and oppressed by the Israeli colonial project whose aim is to establish total and exclusive control on all of Palestine's soil to deny the Palestinian people its inalienable right to self-determination and deprive it of its right to live freely in its native land. The ongoing Israeli aggression against Gaza demonstrates this tragedy. A population of over two million innocent and defenseless civilians is the victim of a campaign of wanton death and destruction, consequence of the collective uh, punishment exerted by the occupying power for decades. That's why at the conference of heads of state and government of members of the African Union that was held on 17 and 18 February this year, the heads and state Heads of state and government of member states of the AU expressed, and I quote, their total outrage at the humanitarian catastrophe caused by Israeli forces occurring in the Gaza Strip and their full support for the Palestinian people in their legitimate struggle against Israeli occupation, the heads of state and government of member states of the AU also denounced, and I quote, the collective punishment measures against civilians, especially the attempts to forcibly transfer the Gaza population. Consequently, Israel's aggression against Gaza is nothing but a shameful attempt to create another Nakba, a further catastrophe destined to erasing the Palestinian presence in Palestine. Indeed, barely a few weeks ago, this court recognized the grave peril that the Palestinian people was facing in Gaza when it determined that South Africa, one of the member states of the African Union, had established the plausibility of its allegation according to which Israel is committing genocide. Nothing can justify the unspeakable suffering and horrors inflicted on the population of Gaza. That is the essence of the Palestinian tragedy for over a century. The Palestinian people is enduring a succession of Nakbas from the Balfour Declaration to the wars of 1948, 56, 67 and 82 with the establishment and expansion of Israeli settlements and the construction of the separation wall. At every moment of history, the Palestinians have been the victims of subjugation displacement and dispossession, the escalating violence and the ruthless war machine 
uh, ceaselessly devastating the Palestinian population. Schools, places of worship, homes, hospitals are reduced to nothing, leaving behind them only the smoke of bombs that continue to rain down on Gaza. By miracle, children are born under the rubble, but they're living on borrowed time, given the famine affecting them, grieving families, surviving without water, without electricity, and see day after day their hopes, their dreams, and their destiny disappearing forever under the ruins. The conscience of humankind will never forget it. Mr. President, members of the court, this advisory proceeding aims at preventing this new injustice resulting not just from the force of arms but also Israeli practices comprising the de jure and de facto annexation of Palestinian territories, the illegal establishment of settlements, the alteration of the demographic character of Jerusalem, and then the confiscation and destruction of Palestinian property, expropriation of Palestinian land, the construction of bypass roads, and maintenance of the separation wall. The fact that these Israeli practices in occupied Palestinian territories are continuing and accelerating is the result of the impunity that Israel enjoys and its breach of the right of people and the just Kogan's norms that are enforceable erga omnis. This contempt is illustrated by the Israeli decision to ignore the advisory opinion of this court regarding the separation wall or the countless resolutions passed by UN organs that have documented these violations of international law. This instant advisory proceeding is an opportunity to at last hold Israel accountable for its acts, but also to put an immediate end to its impunity and to uphold general international law, international humanitarian law and human rights law. Furthermore, the African Union is a party to this proceeding because it feels it has a particular responsibility towards the Palestinian people. Its member states emerged from the colonial scourge, waged war against apartheid and racial discrimination and defended the cause of self-determination. Our present here today reflects the sentiment expressed by heads of state and government of African Union member states who stressed, and I quote, the centrality of the just cause of Palestine and the steadfastness of our supportive position and decisions based on our shared values against colonialism, oppression and apartheid and the historically established African solidarity with the Palestinian people in their legitimate quest for freedom and an independent state. Mr. President, members of the court, on the occasion of the advisory opinion of the court on the Chagos Archipelago, the African Union saw the authority and impact of the court's decisions. This opinion indeed contributed to almost ending one of the last living forms of colonialism in Africa. As with this case, the question before you doesn't hinge on a dispute opposing two equal parties, but an asymmetrical situation in which an oppressed people is confronted with an occupying power. Therefore, the court will be able to confirm in the same way as in the Chagos case, the Palestinian people's right to self 
determination and freedom and ensure the state of Palestine is in a position to exercise its full sovereignty and its independence on its territories of West Bank, Gaza, and on its capital, East Jerusalem, before humbly asking the court to give the floor to my colleague, Professor Mohammed Helal, I'd like to address the question of jurisdiction. Our observations will be brief. The vast majority of participants agreed that this instant proceeding, that nothing prevents the court from exercising its advisory function. It's a position that the African Union shares fully and totally. Indeed, the court has already confirmed its jurisdiction in a request for an advisory opinion on the same factual situation in the uh, wall opinion, and it has no reason to uh, divert from that assessment. Furthermore, the jurisprudence of the court has affirmed on numerous occasions that the political nature of a dispute has no incidence on the duty of the court to answer the questions of a legal order put to it by the General Assembly. Moreover, the court has abundant evidentiary material and facts available to it, allowing it to render an advisory opinion. Lastly, the existence of a negotiating process cannot justify by the court the use of its discretion not to render said advisory opinion and contrary to uh, the statements by certain parties, the opinion of the court, far from complicating this process that's in fact at a stalemate, can but strengthen it by clarifying the obligations and legal consequences for all parties. In concluding, I should like to recall the words of Nelson Mandela a few years after the liberation of South Africa. He issued a warning which concerns us all, and I quote, Even our own freedom, we can fall into the trap of washing our hands of difficulties that others face, yet we would be less than humans if we did so. And it is in this spirit that he spoke the words that continue to resonate in the streets of the whole world today. It's incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Mr. President. Mr. President, I now ask you to kindly give the floor to my colleague, Professor Mohamed Halal. Thank you for your kind attention. Je remercie Madame Geldic. I now give to Mr. Mohamed Halal. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before the court on behalf of the African Union. As indicated by the Legal Council of the African Union, I will cover the following issues. I will identify the internationally wrongful acts that are attributable to Israel and address the question of the legal status of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. Second. I will address the question of whether there are circumstances precluding the wrongfulness of acts that are attributable to Israel. And third, I will outline the legal consequences arising out of these internationally wrongful acts. The point of departure for determining the legal status of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories is the question of title. Does Israel have title over the West Bank Gaza and East Jerusalem? The answer is unequivocally no. Given time constraints, I will only identify the main milestones of Palestine's history. Palestine was under Ottoman sovereignty, and it came under British belligerent occupation during World War I. Then, in 1922, Palestine was placed under a League of Nations mandate that provisionally recognized pa Palestine as an independent nation under British administration. 
after which Turkey renounced sovereignty over Palestine pursuant to the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne. This was followed in 1947 by the adoption of the Palestine Partition Plan, which was never implemented. And then in 1948, Britain withdrew from Palestine and Israel unilaterally declared independence, which was followed by armistice agreements in 1949 and the establishment of Egyptian control over Gaza and Jordanian control over East Jerusalem and the West Bank. And finally, in 1967, Israel launched an armed attack as a result of which it occupied the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. At no point in this process did Israel acquire title over these territories. Moreover, theories that support an alleged Israeli title over these territories, such as the claim that the legal status of Palestinian territories was indeterminate, or that there was a sovereign vacuum that Israel was entitled to fill, are entirely unfounded. Accordingly, since 1967, Israel has exercised belligerent occupation over the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. The African Union also submits that Israel's 57-year occupation of the Palestinian territories is unlawful and must be brought to an end. This determination is based on three arguments. First, as the overwhelming majority of parties in these proceedings have argued, Israel's occupation is unlawful because it violates the prohibition on the acquisition of territory by force, which is a corollary of the prohibition on the use of force. This constitutes a violation of a peremptory rule of international law. The evidence on this point is incontrovertible. Pronouncements by Israel's political leaders and the conduct of Israel on the ground reflect an intention to perpetuate the occupation through acts that amount to de jure and de facto annexation of Palestinian territories. Israel's conduct in the current hostilities in Gaza also demonstrates its goal of entrenching its occupation of Gaza. Israel is reportedly planning to establish permanent buffer zones, maintain a long-term active military presence on the ground, and is striving to displace the, the population of Gaza to neighboring states. This conduct, which has been roundly denounced by the African Union, confirms Israel's intent to acquire and annex further Palestinian territory in Gaza. Second, also as the overwhelming majority of parties have argued, Israel's occupation is unlawful because it deprives the Palestinian people of their right to self-determination. It is uncontested that the Palestinians are a people that are entitled to exercise self-determination. It is also established that self-determination is a right that is exercised in relation to a specific territory and that it is unlawful to disrupt the unity and integrity of the territory in relation to which the right to self-determination is exercised. In the present case, the territories on which the Palestinians are entitled to exercise self-determination are the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, which constitute a single, indivisible territorial unit. Violating the right to self-determination also constitutes a violation of a peremptory rule of international law. Third, the cumulative effect of Israeli policies and practices that are associated with the occupation provides an additional basis on which to conclude that the occupation is, as a whole, unlawful. This is a point that deserves to be highlighted because it has been argued that violations of the law of belligerent occupation do not affect the legal status of the occupation. Specifically, the United States claimed, and I quote, that international law does not provide for an occupation itself to be rendered unlawful or void based either on its duration or on any violations of occupation law. This view is incorrect. The violations of international law committed by Israel in the occupied territories constitute continuing and composite breaches of international law. Specifically, Articles 14 and 15 of the ILC Articles on State Responsibility provide a basis for establishing that separate and distinct violations of the law of belligerent occupation can, when combined and viewed cumulatively, lead to the conclusion that the occupation as a whole is unlawful. 
Article 14.2 of the Articles on State Responsibility defines a continuing wrongful act as one that continues in time and remains not in conformity with an international obligation. According to the ILC, examples of a continuing wrongful act include, and I quote, the maintenance, of for, the maintenance by force of colonial domination and unlawful occupation of part of the territory of another state. This confirms the relevance and applicability of this concept to the case of Palestine. Other examples of Israeli practices amounting to continuing breaches include settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, the separation wall, the network of bypass roads, legislative acts purporting to annex portions of the Palestinian territories, and the exploitation of water resources in the West Bank. In addition, internationally wrongful acts that are attributable to Israel should be viewed as composite breaches of international law. As defined by Article 15 of the Articles on State Responsibility, composite acts are made up of a series of actions or omissions defined in aggregate as wrongful. This does not exclude the possibility that every single act in the series could be wrongful in accordance with another obligation. As the ILC explained, the concept of composite breaches is intended to address situations where the responsible entity, including the state, adopted a systematic policy or practice. And that is precisely why the concept of composite breaches is valuable in the present case. It captures the fact that Israel's conduct is not composed of random or isolated wrongful acts. Israel is pursuing a systematic policy that is designed to perpetuate its control of the Palestinian territories. For example, the establishment and expansion of Israeli settlements and the transfer of over 700,000 Israeli settlers to the occupied territories is wrongful under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Similarly, the construction of a bypass road is wrongful under Articles 46 and 52 of the 1907 Hague Regulations and Articles 49, 52, and 53 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. However, in addition, these in addition to violating these specific rules of international law, the settlements, the bypass roads, and the separation wall, and other practices are elements of an Israeli policy through which it is seeking to gain permanent control of the occupied territories, making it impossible to restore the status quo antebellum. These Israeli practices, when viewed in their totality, make the occupation unlawful because they constitute composite wrongful acts that violate the prohibition on the use of force, the prohibition on the acquisition of territory by force, the prohibition on systematic racial discrimination, and the Palestinians' people's inalienable right to self-determination. Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, I will now address the question of whether there are circumstances that preclude the wrongfulness of Israel's conduct. Specifically, I will argue that Israel cannot validly invoke the right to self-determination, excuse me, the right to self-defense to justify its occupation of the Palestinian territories. In this regard, the historical record is unequivocal. Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories was a result of an act of aggression that commenced on June 5, 1967. Moreover, it should be recalled that international law does not recognize a purported right of anticipatory, preemptive, or preventive self-defense. The terms of Article 51 of the Charter are unambiguous. The right to self-defense is triggered, quote, if an armed attack occurs, end quote. Indeed, the, Afri the, the Organization of African Unity declared on numerous occasions that Israel's use of force in 1967 amounted to an act of aggression should also be recalled that in the Wall opinion, the court determined that Article 51 of the Charter has no relevance where the alleged threats invoked by Israel to justify its conduct originate from within, not from outside, the occupied territories. And even if one were to assume arguendo that Israel may invoke the right to self-defense as a circumstance precluding wrongfulness, which it cannot, it is patently clear that self-defense cannot justify Israel's practices. Self-defense is a narrowly construed exception to the prohibition on the use of force. Israel's practices that are designed to perpetuate its occupation can never satisfy the requirements of necessity and proportionality. 
Furthermore, as several states have already affirmed in their pleadings, the exercise of self-defense can never provide a valid basis for acquiring title to territory that is, that is occupied as a result of the exercise of the right to self-defense. Moreover, given that many of the internationally wrongful acts attributable to Israel are violations of rules of use kogans, it, are, it is our submission that self-defense cannot be invoked in this context. Article 26 of the ILC Articles on State Responsibility and Article 18 of the ILC Conclusions on Identification and Legal Consequences of Peremptory Norms of General International Law are clear. Quote, where the responsibility of a state for a breach of a peremptory norm is invoked, the state against which the breach is invoked cannot excuse itself from responsibility by raising any circumstance that might ordinarily preclude its wrongfulness. In short, the African Union submits that Israel cannot invoke self-defense as a circumstance precluding wrongfulness. Finally, Mr. President, distinguished members of the court, I will turn to the question of the consequences arising from these internationally wrongful acts. The ILC Articles on State Responsibility affirm the customary principle that, quote, every internationally wrongful act entails the international responsibility of the responsible state. It is on this basis that the Chagos opinion, that, that in the Chagos opinion, after the court determined that the United Kingdom's continued administration of the Chagos Archipelago constituted a wrongful act, it was held that the United Kingdom was under an obligation to bring an end to its administration of Chagos, quote, as rapidly as possible, thereby enabling Mauritius to complete the decolonization of its territory consistent with the right to self-determination. The same is required here. Israel must end its unlawful occupation of all the Palestinian territories as rapidly as possible in order to enable the Palestinian people to exercise their fundamental right of self-determination. This is the request that the majority of parties participating in these proceedings have made. The United Kingdom, however, is a notable outlier on this point. It argues that if the court were to address the status of the occupation and require Israel's withdrawal, that would undermine the Security Council's framework that is premised on reaching a two-state solution through a process of negotiations. The African Union does not agree. To condition the end of occupation on a negotiated settlement is to make the occupation permanent given that the occupying power, Israel, refuses to negotiate on the basis of the two-state solution. And it has declared its will that it will never accept the establishment of a Palestinian state. Those states that purport to support the two-state solution ought to endorse calls for this court to unequivocally determine that Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories is unlawful. This is especially necessary given the peremptory nature of the right to self-determination and the prohibition on the acquisition of territory by force. The modalities necessary to end the occupation as rapidly as possible could be decided under the supervision of the relevant organs of the United Nations. Israel's unlawful occupation of the Palestinian territories also gives rise to consequences for other states, including the customary legal obligations reflected in Article 41 of the Articles on State Responsibility, which are, one, not to recognize any benefit accruing to Israel from the unlawful occupation, two, not to lend aid or assistance to Israel that might further the occupation, and three, to cooperate to end the unlawful occupation and to protect the right of self-determination of the Palestinian people. It is perplexing that the United States has challenged the customary status of Article 41. This long-established principle has been recognized by the court itself in the Wall Advisory Opinion and by the UN Security Council. It was even applied by the United States in 1932 in the context of the Japanese aggression against China in what was known as the Stimson Doctrine. Pursuant to this doctrine, the United States, the United States government declared that, quote, it cannot admit the legality of any situation de facto, nor does it intend to recognize any treaty or agreement that impairs the sovereignty, independence, or territorial integrity of China. The court should uphold this principle. 
In its written statement, the African Union offered various specific ways in which states may practically and meaningfully comply with these obligations of non-recognition, non-assistance, and cooperation. The African Union simply wishes to emphasize that occupation and self-determination cannot exist at the same place and the same time. If occupation is illegal, we must end, it must be ended to permit the recognition of self-determination. In closing, Mr. President, members of the court, the African Union reiterates its call to end Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. The injustice being wrought against the people of Gaza, as we convene here in the Great Hall of Justice, makes it imperative to end Israel's impunity and hold it accountable to the rule of law. The court of history may very well judge the credibility of international law on the basis of the outcome of these proceedings. The international community has let down the Palestinian people, but the African Union has faith that in this court, justice will prevail. The betrayal of the sacred trust that is the self-determination of the Palestinian people is an enduring injustice that pleads to be remedied. It is the only path towards ensuring a future of security, stability, peace and prosperity for the peoples of a troubled region. Thank you for your attention. I thank the delegation of the African Union for its presentation. The court will meet again this afternoon at 3 p.m. to hear Spain, Fiji and the Maldives. The sitting is adjourned.